Sorry, I was gonna share TMI on this. Does this feel like really blunt and weird? <laughs> <laughs> a system that is designed by men, also known as the patriarchy. Ever heard of it? <laughs> I can be that person that I always needed when I was younger. It's representation of reality. It is inclusive of all of the beautiful spectrum of like womanhood. We are all not the same. We are all very different and have our own talents and perspectives. You like when I'm outspoken until I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Coach Conversations, where Coach is bringing people together to talk about culture, community, and the things that matter most. My name is Mina Harris. I'm a lawyer, an author, and an entrepreneur, and I'm helping to lead this month's discussion, which is all about game-changing women. And I happen to have two game changers on the call with me right now. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Yuna. Hi, Paloma. Hi, Mina. Hi, Paloma. How are you girls doing? I'm super excited to be on the call with you guys all today. For anyone who doesn't know, Paloma is a model who's helping redefine what inclusion means in the fashion industry. And Paloma, I know congratulations are in order for you. I saw the January Vogue cover and I saw the video of you sharing it with your mother and grandmother. And I just want to know all about that moment. Like, is this your dream to be on the cover of Vogue and how did that feel? Um, well, thank you so much um, for saying that. Growing up, I never thought that one, being a model was possible for me and also kind of being on the cover of American Vogue is one of the most iconic privileges in the fashion industry. And also for me, it felt like definitely a profound honor, but also um, I think it just meant a lot for other people, which brought me a lot of pride and joy. I think it's often an amazing honor to represent people. Well, I remember getting the confirmation and like not really knowing how to process it. I think that as women, it's often difficult, and I can speak for myself, to celebrate like huge accomplishments in these ways. I was like very startled and a little bit like numbed out and kind of until I literally unwrapped that newspaper wrapping to see the magazine, did it feel like truly real? And that's why I really wanted to share it with people who made me feel really safe, which obviously are my mom and my grandma who kind of like this quiet voice in my mind when everything gets loud. So I really wanted to share that with them and ultimately share that with the world. Well, it's, it's beautiful, obviously. And also I think there is that representation matters and for people to see women and girls and others to see themselves uh, in you on that cover is so powerful. Yuna, this is a big year for you too. As I understand it, your career has really come full circle. You started as an indie artist in Malaysia and then signed to a major record label, moved to the United States where you topped the charts with collaborations with artists like Usher. And now you're starting a new chapter, going indie again with your record label, Yuna Room Records. How does it feel to come full circle? And you know, do you feel like you're you're taking complete control of your career? What does that feel like? Yeah, it's I mean, it's pretty surreal. You know, I was actually in law school when I first started out making music and just in my bedroom, you know, it was just like a $10 microphone, like super cheap microphone. To think of that moment and how far I've come. Now I'm back to being an indie artist, an independent artist, back to my label so I can do my own thing. I love telling people about mm. that story, like, <laughs> you know, you, you too can do it, you know, and um, it really is just, it seems impossible, but if you put your mind into it, you can definitely mm. just do it your own way, you know? Did I hear you say you started this when you were in law school? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm a recovering lawyer and I love hearing about people pursuing their passions when they were in law school because that was also sort of my story. So yeah, that's right. <laughs> Wait, Mina, you've had an amazing career oh. already, but your latest projects have the most to do with women who are changing the game. You've got your fashion company phenomenal and the children's books you've been writing. Let people know what you do and how those things work together. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I I wear a lot of different hats. As you said, I'm, you know, the founder and CEO of Phenomenal, and I'm also an author. I just released my second kids book, Ambitious Girl. It just came out in January, and it's all about female ambition, just inspiring women who are doing incredible things in the world, which is really the focus for Phenomenal, and I'm now getting to do that through kids books too. So I'm really grateful. It's amazing. 
So, I mean, there's a lot of ways to talk about women and, and inspiring women and, and our contributions, right? It's a big topic. And obviously, um, we are all not the same. We are all very different and have our own talents and perspectives, um, even if the media can make it seem like we are all the same. And you just need one of us. Uh, and that, you know, checks your box for having female representation. We need to have more and more and more. So I want to talk about representation and, you know, making space for different types of, of womanhood. Separately of media, my body, what my body is, the, is the centerpiece of my conversation. You know, other you know parts of my identity at which intersect that like occupy marginalized identity, but my body is always the centerpiece. But it's very interesting to me because actually my specific size is the majority size of women in America. Paloma, can you say that? Can you say that again? I want people to hear that. Again, okay. Your body size is my size as an American U.S. size 14, 12, 14, but I'll say comfortably 14 is the standard American woman size. If you statistically, this is the normal body size of a woman in America. And so it's often interesting that there's something so radical or so powerful about my body being this departure from all this stuff when it's like, this is the size that most women in America are. Representation is not only like, you know, feels good, it's imperative, it's a necessity. It allows those women or people who identify as women to see themselves in the clothes that ultimately that they will wear or want to wear. You know, I think Coach is doing an incredible job at kind of building not only like relationships with different types of people and different identities, but for an actually like authentic partnership, which I think is where the brands, especially luxury or blue chip brands need to go in the representation sector. There's still so far for us to go. I don't believe that like it stops with me and I don't, and, it, and I hope it doesn't and it better not. <laughs> it better not, well. It's the beginning, it's the beginning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Something that just really struck me is, uh, and why I asked you to repeat it for our audience, which is, uh, it's representation of reality, right? Like, what is our standard of normal? And it's, it's, it's reclaiming that, and it's really fundamental, as you said. I mean, it's about dignity and, and being able to see yourself um, as, as we know we all exist. You know, what about you in your experience as, you know, an Asian Muslim pop star, even in Malaysia, it was something very um, kind of like, it's, it was deemed radical. You know, it was deemed as something that's like, oh, that's not normal. She's wearing a hijab, she's covering her hair, she's covering everything, and she's making pop music, you know? So, you know, I guess in the beginning, I really didn't think about it, uh, about that that much, because I was like, you know, very young, and I got into music, and it was just purely about the music. I think um, maybe like in the last, seven years maybe, I started to realize my presence in the music industry, it's giving an impact, you know? Like when people come to my show, they're actually like looking at someone, okay, well, this is like, you know, a reference, if you will. Like when I first started out, I didn't have anybody to reference a music career from, you know? Like it was, who do, mm -hmm. I, who do I refer to, you know? So maybe now um, I can be that person that I always wanted you know, that I, that I needed when I was younger. Now it's just like, you know, like continuing this journey, like, okay, like what else can I do to, to continue this conversation? Yeah, you said, you know, you just get to be. And I think <laughs> on this topic of representation, we know that you can't be what you can't see, right? And uh, for me as a parent and, and, and really what inspired me initially to write books was um, really just appreciating that firsthand with my daughters. And not only did I understand you can't be what you can't see, but further, when we're reading books, they, or when they see things in the world or videos or other, right, images, they want to be what they see. So, yeah. you know, the older one for the last uh, two years has been going around saying that she wants to be a president when she grows up and, not or, and an astronaut yes. and that is because you know she saw women running for president and she read a book about Mae Jemison 
And so that is something that she knows is possible for her if she wants to do that, right? I guess also when we talk about diversity and representation, we just have to center it in intersectionality as well. It's not just a fact that women come with all types of experience and from all walks of life. It's also like, I don't know if it's an, even an asset as much as it's an imperative part of the movement that we look at what what that is. You know, I think that there is definitely an air around womanhood that we have to understand that's also like trans inclusive. It's inclusive of, of, of spectrum of skin tones, of body types. I think that there has been like messaging sometimes around some of these movements um, that feel very co-opty or like cute and like, being a woman in this world isn't often cute and we have to like hold space for all of those kind of harrowing elements and that's what intersectionality is about valuing and understanding that it is inclusive of all of the beautiful spectrum of like womanhood that has to offer you know so i guess i just felt like that it's important to acknowledge. You know, I think this is also why we're here and having this conversation, which is that we know how important it is that women lift each other up. Um, but we also know that we're working within a system that is designed by men, also known as the patriarchy. Ever heard of it? <laughs> yeah, I don't know her. <laughs> um, I don't recognize her, but, uh, or, or him, him, I guess that's not uh, proper there, but you know, that puts us at a disadvantage, right? And <laughs> creates <laughs> power imbalances, creates harm and oppression that can very simply make it hard for a woman to be, right? You know, we're talking about just able, being able to be in the world, however the hell we want. <laughs> but, you know, especially in the workplace and, and professional context to be taken seriously, um, to have agency, right? In the professional world, to not be unfairly perceived as, I don't know, too ambitious, too aggressive, mm -hmm. too this, too that, right? And, you know, I know you're an independent recording artist now with your own label. Can we talk about ownership? Well, it's definitely challenging, you know, like uh, you don't have a huge team with you. But at the same time, it's like, it's exciting because I get to call the shots, number one. And number two... I know that my work is finally mine. Like now, like I released three songs so far and I own all three, like the masters of all the three songs. So now, you know, as a musician, that's like a, a very important thing to own your masters. You feel like you want to do more. And that's like a something that's very uh, motivating to me, you know, to create more music, to work with more people. It's very empowering. And also, you know, I hope it empowers other other women to, to do the same thing, you know? I think now as I grow older, like I'm 34 now, I'm not a mother yet, but I feel like I'm already a mother to like all these like 20, 30 different kids like back here in Malaysia, who's just like, you know, take my number, call me whenever if you need any help, don't sign anything before talking to me. So I have a purpose, you know, other than writing music and releasing music, that's another thing that I'm really passionate about. So I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paloma, you talked already about purpose uh, and, and the effect of what you're doing and the inspiration and people seeing it and the power of that. Can you talk about your journey and in this context of that feeling of, of ownership and, and agency and, and charting your own unique path? I started because I existed in a marginalized body, both like being like multiracial. I've never been thin. I grew up, um, yeah, like low income, par under the poverty, the poverty line, going to pretty prestigious, predominantly white schools. So I was actually very early on catapulted into investigating my own autonomy and where I stood and my position in the world. But when I did, ultimately get signed and start working, doing photo shoots and doing stuff like that. I knew fundamentally I couldn't strip away who I was, you know? I could be weird, I could be a little tomboy. I didn't have to be the like sexy Glamazon plus size model that everybody wanted me to be. And what achievements 
I've had, it was because I was relentless about not becoming somebody that I wasn't. It annoys my agents. I ask so many questions, like why? But I've always been like that since I was a kid. I've always been incredibly curious, incredibly anti-authority. <laughs> I'll be booked for something like, oh my God, Paloma, you're so um, outspoken and you know, whatever. And then as soon as it's like directed at them, they're like, oop, I'm like, you like when I'm outspoken until I'm talking to you. <laughs> exactly. I think in the end it served me. And I think that that's just like the biggest token that I have for women and girls and people who ask me about how to have success in this industry is figure out who you are, why you are and what you like and stick to it. Mm. I want to take us out on a fun note. Okay. So if you're up for it, <laughs> we are going to play a little game of fill in the blank. The first thing I think when I wake up in the morning is... Oh my gosh, I went straight to coffee, you guys. Honestly, thank you. I say thank you. It's like my thing. That's such a great practice. I love it. All right, next one is my new quarantine hobby is... Okay, mine is skateboarding. I love <gasps> skateboarding now. Cute, I love that. I don't really have a new hobby. I guess I downloaded TikTok. <laughs> I don't use it. I don't know how to use it. I feel like a definite like old person, like, but it's really informative. I was gonna say roller skating. And I think it is, I think I was influenced by TikTok. So, well, TikTok and my four-year-old, she asked for roller skates for Christmas. And obviously I had to get my own pair. So that's my quarantine. Nice. <laughs> All right. The thing that makes me feel most powerful is I'm going to answer this and just say my brain. Honestly, respect. I feel that. <laughs> for me, when I say no to people, I'm like, okay, well, it's a no for me, you know? So, yeah. All right, the thing that makes me feel most beautiful is? I mean, honestly, I feel really beautiful when I'm naked. I just, I like getting dressed up, but I feel the most beautiful when I'm naked. When I'm not wearing makeup. I wish I could tell my eight-year-old self mm. what? I would tell my eight-year-old self Yes, you can. Of course, like I have my mom who would tell me that all the time, but deep inside, it's always like, I don't know if I can do this, but yeah, that's what I would say. Yes, you can. I would say both, everything's gonna be okay and keep going. I guess what I would tell my eight-year-old self is to keep asking questions. <laughs> all right, I wish I could tell my 80-year-old self. What? <sighs> You really did that, huh? <laughs> so I'm gonna say to my 80 year old self. Yeah, I'm like, maybe I'll tell myself at 80, stop asking questions. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Finally stop asking questions. <laughs> I hope to tell my 80 year old self that she, that I'm proud of you, you know? I don't know, that one makes me wanna cry. <laughs> oh my God, I know I feel like emotional. Um, I'm proud of you. Well, thank you so much Paloma and Yuna for chatting with me here today. And thank you so much to Coach for putting this all together, for bringing us together. And thank you all out there to our audience for watching. If you want to catch more episodes of Coach Conversations, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. <laughs> so you'll stay in the loop. There's some really great stuff in the works, and I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> it was so nice to meet you. It was so nice to chat with everybody. Ooh, all right. Bye. Thank you so much.